Hi everyone, Alex from Coram Deo Farm. We are a year three Oklahoma flower farm that sells retail market bouquets from our roadside stand. And during the off season, when we don't have beautiful flowers live to show you, we have been recording interviews with some really successful and wise flower farmers in our industry that have a lot to teach us. And so in today's video, we, I got to interview Lenny Larkin, Lenny Larkin, she operates B-Side Farm. It used to be in California, now it's in Oregon, and she's gonna tell us all about the origin of that. She has been growing for over 10 years, has built a profitable six-figure farm, focused primarily on her roadside stand, which you know I'm gonna to love to hear about, as well as uh, farmer florist and wedding design work. And so if you are interested in that or selling wholesale, I really think she has a lot to offer because she's experienced both and she's done it successfully and on top of being a wonderful grower she is re a really talented educator and so she does such a great job explaining how to be profitable and how to reach your goals talking both about the keys to success and the pitfalls we can fall into so pause this video and get yourself a notepad I'm not kidding you're gonna want to take notes throughout all of this interview and I hope at the end you leave feeling encouraged and excited about your flower farming year with a long to-do list of things to accomplish and to think about. So let's get started. We've got Lenny here. I just gave you a little intro and you watch just like awesome footage of her beautiful farm and flowers because that's why you're here. You want to talk about flowers, but we're not just going to look at beautiful flowers. We're going to talk about how to have profitable flowers. And that's why I'm so excited to have Lenny on our channel because she is like the queen of profitability and all the things you don't think about. And sometimes she jokes and calls it boring, but it's the boring <laughs> stuff that keeps you in business. So that's why we want to talk about it. So Lenny, I want you to get us your full and proper intro. Tell us about your farm. I know it's interesting because you have your first farm and now your new farm. And so it's a really yeah. interesting story. So please share with us. Yeah. Well, first of all, Alex, thank you so much for having me. This is really fun. I feel like we have the same color wall. So it looks like we're sitting across the room from each other, which is I'll pretty pretend. Fun. Yeah, totally. Hey, yeah. Um, I'll hand you a glass of water and you'll like right. grab one from somewhere. <laughs> Um, yeah, thank you for having me. This is so fun. And as I've said, I really appreciate you trying to keep it real with your audience and with your farm and sharing what you guys are doing and learning. And I just, I really appreciate that. And yeah, it is this like, quote unquote, boring stuff that really makes such a difference in flower farming. And it's, you know, I went to school for farming and I didn't even think about all this stuff until a few years in. So I'm so glad that they're seems to be a trend of more beginning and intermediate flower farmers learning this stuff earlier, which is awesome. Um, so yeah, I have B-Side Farm and then Flower Farming for Profit. So I'll talk about both. I'll talk about B-Side Farm first because I started it first. Um, so I, I moved to California. I'm from Boston originally. I moved to California in 2011 to learn how to teach farming, basically. I had like worked on farms in high school and then gone a completely different route until my late 20s. Um, working in social work and teaching and all this stuff, and then realized that I wanted to get back to farming. It was kind of my true calling. And so I specifically went to the 
farming program at UC Santa Cruz. It's like a six month, really intensive apprenticeship. I went there with the goal of learning how to teach farming skills. So um, it's funny because I sort of moved away from teaching a little bit for a few years. And now I'm clearly back in at full force teaching flower farming business stuff. But I just love looking back. I actually pulled up my application to that program like last week to see like, what did I say to get into that program? And I had said, you know, I really think that there's a place for more education around these topics. So it's just funny that I've been thinking about this so for so long and I kind of forgot that, but did that, ran a vegetable farm for a few years and then ultimately started B-Side Farm. So I had B-Side Farm in California, started it about 10 years ago now, and then moved to Oregon a year ago. So B-Side Farm did everything as like most farms do, right? I sold a lot to florists. And since I dove into B-Side with a lot of farming experience already, and because I had already been growing and selling flowers for the other vegetable farm I managed, I dove right in. Like from the get-go, I was bringing in money. I was making money. I was growing tons of crops. I kind of like figured out a lot of the growing stuff in my other job. So I was able to jump in full force, which I think allowed me to also burn out more quickly. It's like I started I geared up more quickly, but then I burned out more quickly too, as happens. And did you start in the beginning years of your firm? Did you kind of do what everyone is the problems? And we'll get into this of what you see where did you really launch, like grow all the things and sell all the ways? And then you started to pare down or did you kind of know going into it? I would say I did the former. I So I didn't do it the smart way. So it's like I was able, it's a great question. I was able to grow my business and my sales and lots of crops really quickly, but I wasn't smart about it yet. I didn't have- Is that the burnout? Is that the burnout? Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's where the burnout came from. Yeah. I was growing everything. I just like how now I- tell flower farmers that I work with, I'm like, the last thing I want to see on your website is like, we grow 50 unique crops or we grow a hundred unique crops. I'm like, no, 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 no. But that's what I did for sure. In the beginning, we sold a lot to florists from the get go and to small wholesalers and grocery. And we, um, I did a lot of weddings. I did a lot of full service weddings. So I, you know, started with a barely had a minimum and then I crept up and eventually had like a $7,000 minimum for weddings and I usually brought in around a hundred grand in weddings every year, and then another hundred grand up to 150 grand in other enterprises throughout the year. And we can talk more about my numbers later. I'm always so happy to talk about numbers because I think that's one thing that is hard to learn about, right? It's hard to like get a sense of how much money flower farmers it's make. It's really generous too, because on on our channel and in our Facebook group, I kind of talk about, I've called it the sparkle and it's like what Instagram sells you. It sells you this like sparkle and you can see that someone grew, you know, an incredible handful of dahlias. But what you can't see is like how many were left on the plant that were not harvested. How you know much did they spend on that tuber? Yeah. How you know did they sell that bunch? That's a beautiful picture on Instagram. And so you have all these sparkle farms, not in judgment. They, you know, we just don't know. Like you can't see their books and so right. when we can hear farmers that are willing to be generous enough with real numbers it starts yeah. to give us kind of like handles on reality to be better oh. equipped to manage social media intake yeah yeah absolutely and yeah that's so true what you said about the context and for us for small flower small farms small flower farms in particular but veggie farms too it's all about the labor it's all about like that's our biggest expense it's our whether or not we're paying ourselves. It's our biggest expense, right? Um, and it is our farms are just inherently really inefficient. So that's why we always have to be fighting to gain efficiency. But that's the part of the people's books you don't always see. It's like how much labor went into generating those sales. And so I'm happy we should circle back and dive more into my finances, but I'll continue with my story right now. I tend to be a little long winded. So you might have to like, I'm I'm bumping you back. (laughs) Oh yeah. Um, And so eventually yeah, B-side evolved. We ended up really focusing on our farm stand, a really targeted P&E CSA and other retail offerings. And so by the time we moved my farm up to talk about, I, you know, the farm was bringing in around 250 grand a year on like three quarters of an acre. And it was really, really manageable because I had done it all. I had worked like all day, every day. I did that for years, you know? And so by, by the, by, I say by the end, just by the time we moved our farm to Oregon and now we're kind of starting over, 
that's what the farm looked like looked like um and in the meantime how many employees did you have kind of like at that point before you moved the farm yeah I'd say usually just sort of pretty small one full-time employee sometimes two part-time employees and then for weddings, I would bring in like four freelancers. Got it. Okay. I used to do weddings all by myself. Oh my God. There were the early days where I would do two weddings in a day by myself in different towns. It was insane. I just like thought I could do it all. And I was ambitious without being smart. I was ambitious. I mean, I learned to be smart. I think that's something you can learn, but it's just insane looking back at the things I used to try to get done by myself. Um, but I started, you know, I've been teaching the whole time. And so I said, I took a little break from teaching while I was really in the, in the throes of building my farm. But after I sort of went back to school and took all these business classes and started learning about accounting and bookkeeping and strategy, I, my, my floral design workshops and my, like, you know, I used to teach people how to farm vegetables and farm flowers that all transitioned into me just teaching business strategy to flower farmers. So I was having on farm workshops. I was doing one on one coaching. I used to teach at Santa Rosa Junior College, which has an amazing agriculture and horticulture program. So I was teaching college students there. And then I started getting the idea for the book that just, I just, just came in the mail like two days ago. Ah. Yeah, this is very exciting. So I've been writing this book and I just, I've been writing it for two years. I just finished it. It's with Chelsea Green, who they are the ones who put out um, The Flower Farmer, Lynn Bizinski's book, as well as The Lean Farm and all these great books. Awesome. So this this book just started like taking shape in my head. And so I spent two years writing it and then now have actually officially formed the business that is called Flower Farming for Profit. So I've moved all my teaching stuff over there. We're going to mention this and maybe we can circle it back back okay. at the end. I've learned now, I've done enough like interviews recently that I learned to not forget this stuff that I right. often forget. <laughs> but it's I'm I'm teaching a a live webinar on the 9th. So okay. it'll you know this will air a few days before that mm-hmm. um that I want everyone to come to. We'll put, the link, we'll put the link in the description. Yeah. You guys sign up. Like she said, it's free and we should all want free knowledge. This is yeah. like the easiest step you can do for your farm yeah. is giving Lenny your email and signing up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I love that. And I, I have a special little um gift or incentive for your viewers too, which is that I'm I'm about to launch my big online business course called the Flower Farming Business Academy. And it's going to be over the course of about eight weeks, but self-paced. We can circle back to it at the beginning, but the at the end, but the doors are going to open on the 9th after that webinar. And so any of your viewers who click that link, sign up for my mailing list and come or at least sign up for the webinar, um, they are going to get a coupon for $200 off my course of the Business Academy if they choose to take it. So yeah, anyone, any of your your people who end up wanting to take my Business Academy, they're going to get $200 off, which... Um, I'm just excited to get people into this class. So we can talk more at the end about who it's who it's great for. I don't want to take all the time talking about it, but just no. But this is exciting because the it's exciting to hear about your farm, but then also your educational background because the benefit of this course that I'm seeing from looking at all the content you produce thus far is on one hand you're bringing like actual hands in the dirt decade experience of living and building what you're teaching people to do but then yeah. also you have a passion and a gift and long-term experience in teaching which is different I mean experience is important and there's a lot of profitable flower farmers out there with really great knowledge but being yeah. able to synthesize it and present it and teach it in a way that's replicable for other people's business models and farms and goals is a real skill. And so you're kind of fusing both of these in the course and making it deeply applicable to flower farming because that's what you know, but presented in a way that comes from your education background. And so that's why I'm really excited about this content. And I've said before on my channel that, you know, you're part of, I think, a bit more of like the veteran OG class of flower. (laughs) And when you started you know, there wasn't any of this content, really. I mean, you had Lynn Bazinski's book, but there wasn't a lot of like media content. There was some like hard copy content. 
And so a lot of that you had to learn yourself. And then we have like the florette bubble where she's put such great work into the actual flower growing knowledge, yeah. you know, her yeah. cut flower 101 book. And she just creates so much content. Like how do we grow beautiful flowers? Because you can't have a profitable farm without an excellent product. But yeah. now coming up after Erin naturally is this flower farming course where it's like, okay, we fell in love with flowers. We know how to grow beautiful snapdragons, but how do I build a farm that feeds my family and that can be yeah. around for 10 years like your farm? Yeah. And so this content right now is just, I think, deeply needed for like my class of growers where it's yeah. like, we want to start a flower farm or we just put our toe in the water or we're in year two or three and we feel mentally committed to the goal, but we want to see like, okay, but how do I actually not lose money every year until I right. burn out sort of thing? And this, right. this business academy course that you've created is like filling that next knowledge gap that's really needed. So I'm going to take the course. I can share yeah. with you. I'm going to take the course. And I'm just like a, a evangelist for the course right now because I got a peak. I went to your earlier webinar, you guys. Yeah, yeah. A peak of like the modules. So it's yeah. like more of the details. And I felt kind of like that, that gif emoji where it's like the little boy throwing cash out the window. <laughs> I was just like, this is so much information, like valuable information. And I was like, give it to me. Like, I can't wait to, to, to take the course and to kind of take our farm going into year three, like yeah. to that next level. Yeah. So that's, yeah. I'm, I'm super excited about it. Um, and let's talk about what, not why you made the course, but like the bones of the, the course and just your, your flower farming book and like your passion for building profitable farms. And I think in what something I listened to you do, you kind of called it like the strategic mindset. Let's talk yeah. about what it is that you want other farmers to have and kind of where you see things kind of like falling off the road, <laughs> like where yeah. the problems occur. Yeah. I love that falling off the road. And thank you. Also, I feel like you see me, you see exactly what I'm trying to do. And I really appreciate that. It's hard, you know, it's like, I feel, I know that I've created all this great stuff, the book and the course, and it's, I want to just like scream it all from the rooftops, but at times that feels it feels funny, you know what I mean? Having trying to like sell your stuff all the time. So I appreciate when it comes across exactly how I want it to. So thank you. It's yeah, it's this combination of like my experience on my farm and what worked and what didn't work, but then trial and error in teaching all these different farmers over the years through courses, through one-on-one -on -one coaching, through group group coaching. And there's some lessons I've learned that people just need to go through on their own, some mistakes that I can't warn them away from. So it's almost like I, I've picked my battles in like in what topics to really focus on in my courses because I have honed in on the ones that I've seen make the most impact for my students. Ooh, awesome. So, Can you share some of those with us? Yes. Yeah, I love that. So let's start with the strategic mindset. I wrote that down. Actually, I wrote down a few things, including, including strategic mindset. So, you know, when I started my farm, I just thought I didn't have a roadmap. I didn't have a business plan anything like it. I didn't have a sales goal. I just said, I want to grow more and more flowers and sell more and more flowers. And I just put my head down and I kept doing it. And in my book, I talk about like these signs that your farm is, is working and like, what does it look like in the beginning? How do you define success in the beginning? And I think the way I defined success would be the way a lot of people do, which is, was I selling my flowers? Yes. Was I getting more traction on Instagram or whatever, social media, Google reviews? Yes. Did I have a good reputation locally? Yes. Um, was I producing high quality flowers? Yes. And like, sh sure, those are all things that point towards success. None of those are bad things. Those are all good things. But none of those say anything about the amount of money you're putting in your pocket at the end of the day, the amount of sleep you're getting at night, whether you're selling your flowers, each stem at a, a profitable price point that covers your costs and your labor and put something away for the future, right? Because I didn't have a, like a trust fund or a, I mean, most people don't, but I did. I love when people say that I didn't have a trust fund. It's like, who has a trust fund? Who are you comparing yourself to? But I, you know, I didn't have a safety net is what I'm trying to say. Like I didn't have a re retirement plan. I didn't have that until recently. And it's kind of scary to think about that. I just kind of threw caution to the wind. But so really I want farms to start to 
make a plan earlier on. And if that plan changes 10 times and it will, that's totally fine. But having the plan will kind of bring you into reality more quickly. It'll help you translate all of your precious hours that you're pouring into the farm. It'll help you translate how that is going to lead to dollars and a solid income and a solid rate of pay for your employees and hopefully your retirement account for you. So this strategic mindset is really about starting to quiet all the noise on the farm. And I'm thinking like it's mid-August, it's so hot, the weeds are out of control, you missed getting your last succession of crops into the ground and you don't know if you should start the next succession or save the previous succession and you don't know what that means for your sewing schedule. Um, you're slipping on communication with customers because of the aforementioned weeds and root bound plugs and all this. And you just, your capacity to make decisions dwindles. Your bandwidth is like non-existent. So I think we just have, I'm not going to say that people make bad decisions. To some extent, there's just little choices that need to be made every day on the farm and you're never necessarily going wrong. But I think this kind of decision fatigue sets in and your emotion and your overwhelm and your burnout clouds your judgment. And so you don't have this capability to be the driving force behind your business and really view it strategically, like it needs to be viewed. And and really, what do I mean by strategic? I mean that you're evaluating these opportunities, these forks in the road, whether it's, should I start selling flowers at the hardware store down the street that approached me about doing pop-ups? Or should I start doing DIY weddings? Or should I hire this person, even though I'm not quite ready to hire this person? Any kind of decision like this. And I really want to help people. And I've been able to help people through my stuff, my coaching and my teaching, learn how to quiet out all that noise, learn how to not focus on the decisions that aren't going to lead to bigger changes and use data and actual numbers in order to evaluate like option A, option B, decide which is going to be the best for you with the information you have at the time, choose that option and move forward and define what success would look like. So that was kind of a mouthful, but like in the hardware store example, it's like, okay, yeah, well, I I could start selling flowers at the hardware store on Saturdays, but what's a realistic sales projection of what I might bring in? Do they have good traffic there? Do they sell things like this? What might the price point be? Is it, you know, is it gaining a new audience for me? Is it people who don't already know, know about me? And it's another way to sell my flowers. What's the opportunity cost? What am I giving up by selling there on Saturdays? What else would I be doing with those flowers? And then, like I said, circling back around to defining what success would look like. Like, would I be happy if five bouquets sold there every Saturday? Or do I really need 20 bouquets to sell in order to make it worth my while? And should I give it a month or should I give it three months? What's a good amount of time to to run this test? So it's all an experiment. And the earlier people can start to quiet out the noise and view these bigger decisions as experiments that they are moving through with some solid data and some guesstimation, sure, the more that they can guide their business towards what's working and away from what's not working from the get-go. Okay. I love that you just ended there with the get-go because what I'm hearing in my mind of people that are watching this that are like, okay, Lenny, like that's great for the year six farm Mm -hmm. staff and Excel spreadsheets. That's great when, you know, you've been selling for five years or you sell a hundred bouquets a week, but like, I'm just starting out or I'm just trying to sell 20 bouquets. Like I don't need, like that feels too businessy. Yeah. Well, but what's really happening, what that, what's really going to happen to that person is they're going to be the burnout person. Like yeah. they're, at some point you're, if you're going to be a profitable business, you have to operate like a business. And so what's happening is like, either you're going to have that strategic mindset shift and commit to that now in your business, or you're just going to like slam into a wall because you've been losing money or you're burned out, or you've been you yeah. know, making not the best decisions, and then you're going to yeah. be forced to. So like yep. the loving, truthful way is to be like, get those roadblocks out of your way and start now, even if it's really small, even if it's yep. saying, like this coffee shop approached me and yeah, I could sell five bouquets, but 
I have to let go of those five bouquets as a success metric and say like, it's not worth my time to be driving to and there a couple times a week to sell those yeah. five. Yeah. That's a business decision. That's a strategic mindset. Yeah. It's not like a $10,000 wedding, but you don't get to the $10,000 wedding if you're so tired from driving to the coffee shop to and fro. Totally. So like, start it, start thinking early as you can apply it to where you're at. And then as you get bigger, you scale up and you, you start to have more decision metrics that come in as your business yeah. grows, but you can start your first year asking yeah. questions. Absolutely. And you can sketch it out on the back of a napkin. You know what I mean? It doesn't need to be a spread. I'm all about spreadsheets, obviously, but it's funny because I'm not even that good at spreadsheets. I'm not like the fanciest spreadsheet user. Like mine are pretty ugly and basic, but I use them all the time. My boyfriend laughs like, you know, if we're trying to decide where to go out to dinner or something, he's like, do you need to make a spreadsheet about it? Um, But, and I do sometimes. You're like but, pros and cons lists need to yeah, make exactly. problems. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. So yeah, you're so right. What you said is so right. Maybe if it's your first the first flower sale you've ever done, maybe you can hold off on this strategy a little bit. But once you're once you're used to the the rhythm of growing and cutting and selling a few flowers, you can absolutely create a little experiment around that. Define what success would look like. To you know, and if the first week you don't sell any bouquets and the second week you sell one bouquet, you're moving in the right direction, you know what I mean? And and keep track of that and keep track of how many people you're reaching out to. And maybe you're printing out postcards to go along with those bouquets or for other people at the hardware store or the coffee shop to take. Note how many you bring and how many are taken. Better yet, you have a QR code that leads them to your website, even if it's like the simplest website in the world, which is totally fine to start with. And then you can track how many people come to your website or sign up for your mailing list. It's just these small incremental gains that are going to build your build your following, build your customer base. And looking back over Calif- over my time in California, it's all of these little steps that led me to have a really solid reputation and to ult- ultimately be selling what were some of the most expensive bouquets in the area which led me to a really profitable business. It's not the only thing, but like I had a price high price point on my bouquets and they still sold because people trusted my flowers and I had built up that credibility over time. Yeah. And I like what you said about like your, your data collection and what you're focusing on can grow with your business. So like we're going into year three and I think we've avoided the common trap of growing too many varieties in too many ways. You know, we have about, we're going mm-hmm. year three with 15 varieties and just the roadside stand. So like I love I'm that. pretty streamlined. I don't as of yet want to make that flower list smaller. Some of them yeah. might get kicked out, but I feel really like I know how to grow those 15. So my mind isn't cluttered with like the growing complications of 40 different varieties. Yeah. We had a great year too. But I'm realizing now going into year three that there are there is data I need to start collecting. You know, I survived yeah. through year two without it. But now yep. it's like, okay, I need to start collecting like how many zinnia stems I'm getting from my 60 foot row. Because if I find out like I'm leaving 40% on the plant, it's like, yeah. well, why am I growing 60 feet? I should be growing like... 40 feet next year because then I don't have to Absolutely. buy the seed and plant and water and take care of and fertilize and do all the things I need to shrink that or you know I need to get faster at harvesting sunflowers I need to rethink my process like it was sufficient in year two but we're growing we're selling so much more in year three I need to streamline that like I don't have as much time to like skip through the rows as maybe I did in year one <laughs> or three is like can I do this in 30 minutes sort of yeah so that's growing with yeah. our business and like as our sales are growing, like I need to start collecting different data points. So it's not like you said in year one, do you need to have like Excel spreadsheets for all systems and processes? But there right. are things you can be thinking about or even just like looking towards like, yeah, no, I need to be thinking about this or I need to keep this in yeah. mind. Even if your Excel spreadsheet doesn't look the same as like a year five farm, for example. Totally. And I would love if all the new growers out there are just trying to keep track of the following few things this season, like pick a couple of your biggest crops that you're going to grow, maybe 
start you maybe two crops maybe it's five crops if you're a little bit more ambitious and keep track of how many stems like just like you said how many stems you harvest out of that sunflower bed and then this is what i would love for all farmers to start doing the one is the yields data and if you have that information your world's ahead of most farmers even farmers who have been at this for 10 years most people do not have great records of how many stems come out of a given amount of space which is just silly of course it'll vary year to year but that's not the silly part. The silly, silly part is that we we don't we just don't keep good track. You know, we have sales records, but we don't have yield records. Um, and so keeping track of the yield, which sounds fancy, but it could be as simple as having a clipboard and you write sunflowers on a piece of paper and you write your harvest every week or whatever it is. And then as you're finishing the bed for the season, as like you harvest that last sunflower before the rest of the sunflowers in the bed have blown open or have been eaten by cucumber beetles or whatever it is, look back at the bed and give an estimate of how much of the bed did go to waste. Like how many sellable stems, not stems, what percentage of the bed's sellable stems like do I think? 20%. I didn't. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. Was it 20%? Was it like over half? You can start with, was it over half or less than half? And then move from there. And it's just an approximation. And if you want to get nitty gritty, the other thing would be to add what percentage of the bed was out of your control, but not sellable. So like cucumber beetles or what crop failure, whatever, but even just those two numbers, the yield and the percent not sold, just like you said, that'll help you so much going into next year's crop planning. So it's not a shot in the dark. So you said, oh, we sold and cut a hundred percent of our sunflowers this year, which means we could grow more next year. Maybe we could also charge more for our sunflowers, but we only cut and sold half of our agrostema because the agrostemma got away from us. Well, maybe that means next year you only grow half as much agrostemma or you really put a plan in place to make sure you can sell all those stems. Yeah. Because the, like we're growing all these, you go to all, so many farms and there's just so many flowers that are out in the field, not being cut, not being sold. And it's, it's hard. I, there's so many growing pains with farms that are trying to scale up. So I have all the empathy in the world for these farms and I'm never like talking dirt about them, but it's just, there's a way to track what you're doing and to grow less. And growing less means planting less, weeding less, looking at a sowing schedule less, walking less. Like, you know, but, but because I was able to first grow at these larger scales, when I scaled down my annual field to like a quarter of an acre, it meant that I was so hyper efficient on that quarter acre and I was cutting and selling every single step. Yeah. Yeah. And then, so that's like, I love that. So it's like, you can do this now, no excuses. Like you said, pick two flowers and track those, track that data. But yeah. then the thing that I'd love to hear you talk about, because this is a big passion of yours, is the thing that's hard to track and that's your labor. So yes. I saw you did an Instagram story. I believe you were talking about a farm that was a, was a bigger farm of tracking a certain variety of flower. I think it was maybe sweet peas and you, yep. you had the awesome pie chart with all the data and it yep. ended up being so, if I remember correctly, it ended up being so harvest labor intensive that even though they loved the flower and maybe their florists loved the flower. And so on like that success metric, it was checking those boxes. Yep. But when you looked at the pie chart and like 40 some odd percent was going to the labor and just like rushing their opportunity to really make money on that yes. flower they probably ended up making that hard reality decision of like we love sweet peas our customers love sweet peas we're not making money on it it's got to go yes. and that's kind of like that next step for farms to start making that like you yes. got to let it go the numbers don't add up but that's absolutely. the labor <laughs> yeah absolutely labor it's so tricky. And so thinking about crop profitability, like I say like so much, thinking about crop profitability. So I've become a researcher. So I, I, I'm in my third year of grant funded research, working with farmers, ushering through them, th them through this extensive crop cost of production or enterprise budget process. So that's like the real nitty gritty specific system where I'm holding their hands and checking in with them throughout the year. But then I tried to take that system, which is based, know your cost to grow. It's a system I didn't create. And I tried to modify it for something that can work well for people at home. And I have that in my book and that will go through it in depth in my course. But it's basically like just taking a step back. I mean, as you said, crop profitability, it's a function of the cost to grow the crop, the selling price of the crop and the crop's yield. 
And so the price, we know that we have, you know, we know our average selling price, the yield, like I said, a lot of us don't have that information, but we can start to gather it pretty easily. I mean, it's hilarious how simple it sounds. It's like, like it's just this, you cut. It's yeah. discipline to do it. Like the answer to the field, you just have to write it down. <laughs> right. Totally. So then it's the other component, the first component, the cost to grow that is the hardest to get at. And it in the the reason is because it's all about labor and because we all run such diversified operations whether you're very part-time, whether you're full-time, you're running around doing a million different things at once. So it's so hard to track what you're doing and which parts of your time are going to which crops. And so, you know, we can really break it down. I think the best thing to do is to start each season, just trying to track a crop or two, and then I'll give you a great example, but um, tracking a crop or two making a list of all the activities that you do to that you perform when you work on that crop from um prepping your bed however you do that whether it's with a tractor or with a broad fork or with a rake or with a tarp um adding compost sowing the seeds or planting the transplants pinching corralling netting and finally weeding and harvesting right so just all the, all the things you do and then you can time yourself doing those things just a couple of times and you can start to gather this information. Um, and it's really important because some crops are making you money and some crops are losing you money. And I'll give this great example that's in the book, actually. And it's from um, Forever Green Flower Company, Cell, who's in England. She's wonderful. I'm sure a lot of your people follow her. She's so, If not, you all should. She's wonderful. Um, so Cell is she teaches this to a lot of people in England. She does a lot of cost of production stuff too. So we kind of like have Zoom sometime and nerd out about this stuff together. Um, she has tracked every single crop she grows on her small farm. It's like a half acre, but wildly productive. And she has this great example of studying nigella and bachelor buds. And the reason to me it's such a poignant example is that these are two crops that she always grew sort of together in tandem every spring. They were two of her big spring crops. She sort of grew the same amount of them. She sort of sells them to the same people. She viewed them as pretty similar. But when she really tracked the profitability of each crop, she found that nigella was twice as profitable as bachelor buns due to a bunch of things, due to harvest speed, due to selling price, due to a bunch of things. But so now it led her to eventually like double her production of nigella and change her production methods on bachelor buttons in order to cut down on cost. And also she only grows now that the like purple or like mauve um, bachelor button, not the bright blue one, because she can charge a little bit better and it kind of fills us. But it's just so interesting. And I have the pie charts in my in my book to show it. It just when she slowed down and looked at the two crops, they seem similar but they really had nothing to do with one another. And if she, let's let's extrapolate and say that she was a farm that was growing all nigella, she would have been wildly profitable. But if she was a farm that was growing all bachelor buttons, she would have been losing money. Wow. So it's just like crops, we can't, we can't juggle all the components of crop profitability in our heads. You think you can, you're like, oh, well, roses, like when I first planted my David Austin roses, I was like, oh, these are high ticket items. These bring in a, a high price point per stem, which they do. But so in my mind, that meant that they were a profitable crop. Mm -hmm. But I didn't know anything about how much they would yield or how much, how long, how, the time it would take me to grow them, you know? So it's just, it's really worth thinking about this stuff from the get go. And you don't have to do it right away, but you can start thinking about it right away. But I think you can also like when you start talking business and it's just like you should track this and monitor this and you need to be mindful of this. I think you can viewers, I think you can start to understand like why these bigger farms that we're hearing from like Lenny hit that burnout point and had to downsize their varieties because it is just not possible in a smaller operation, like you said, it was you and sometimes your partner and a couple employees. Yep. It is yep. not possible to do this with excellence and efficiency and profitability with 45 different varieties. Like it's yep. just simply not there. And so when yep. you're in smaller scale, like us, let's say a quarter acre, like a quarter acre on our farm with 35 different varieties is like inefficiency nonsense. Like <laughs> I one bucket of this flower and a bucket a half of that flower and yeah. they had to be harvested differently and conditioned differently and I had to go and get different buckets and the walking back yeah. and you're just like or I could have harvested harvested three buckets of snapdragons and made yeah. that day you yeah. know so 
I hope too, like, it's not just us saying like, put down the Johnny Seed catalog this winter, but it's like, why you're saying that. It's right. because you right. should be thinking about all these other sub components. And that's just, it's really impossible to yeah. do with the amount of varieties that we're seeing new growers start with. Yes. And I want people to feel more in control of their their businesses earlier on, you know, I saw this, I said this somewhere recently on like a podcast for the book or something, but I watched that show. I think it was on Netflix called blue zones recently. And it was talking about, you know, these groups of people in the world who far outlive other people. Right. And it's some of the stuff that we would assume, like they walk a lot, they walk up a lot of stairs, they eat well, but also they showed these shepherds in Sardinia, I believe. And these people had like one of the lowest stress levels of any group of people anywhere. And they were talking, this psychologist talked about how it was because one of the greatest sources of stress is a lack of control of, over the world, you know, the world at large and then the world in your immediate surroundings. And especially these days, like just problems in the world, wars and famine and just all these issues. And it leaves us to feel really helpless and out of control. And these shepherds were able to really control their immediate environment. If they had an animal that was sick, they could tend to it fix it. You know, they just had this like real sense of control around in this bubble that they lived in. And so I, I I really could not stop thinking about our flower farms and just the stress that comes from feeling out of control all the time, behind all the time, projects unfinished all the time. And I love comparing, more than comparing to the farm you see on Instagram and you're like, well, she yeah. blah, blah, like fill in the totally. Book. Yeah. Right. Right. And so, so what I really love is helping farmers, even from day one, gain a sense of control. Like you have the power to make strategic decisions about your business, to be really methodical about some things, to still go all in and go as hard as you want to and be ambitious, as ambitious as you want to, but not by growing everything under the sun, by trying specific things out and seeing how they do. And I hope it doesn't sound like boring to only grow a dozen crops and, and focus on them and track them. I actually think it's so fun and so gratifying. And if people, you know, I hope people don't think that I've always been this like data nerd or whatever. I'm I'm like a hippie. I like just wanted to be outside and grow flowers. That's why I got into this. But the more I learned some of these business skills, which are just strategy, you know, strategy and implemented them, the more I found this other, this new level of being a small business owner and a farmer, which is just it's working towards setting goals and working towards them and assessing what went wrong and fixing it. And it, it just makes the farm an even more enjoyable place. And it gives you this kind of game and this strategy and these methods to try out and you feel in control and your stress levels just in, decrease the way you would hope stress levels would decrease when you're at your corporate job staring out the window imagining how great it must be to be a flower farmer right I think I heard you say this somewhere and I really resonated with it and so you said I can't remember your exact words we <laughs> were like money's not a dirty word like it's not a bad thing yeah it can be a motivator it's very much a reality but you most of us go into this because we love flowers or we want to own a small business or we want to work from home with our kids next to us, like my husband and I want a family farm, that sort of thing. But yeah. the money is the tool in order to continue to do that. And that's almost like put aside in the beginning when like the catalog is sparkly and you just are like so passionate and excited about the idea. Yeah. But in order to do that in year eight, money and profitability have to be a factor in your thinking from the very beginning, because not many of us can just like lose tens of thousands of dollars from years on end and right. continue doing it. And so right. I I just liked how you said that. It's like you can all just like accept that like yeah. it's okay to have money as a goal because that's the tool to continue the passion that started the whole thing. Absolutely. And I've seen so many farms go out of business and it makes me so sad. And so I think that that's what's at stake. We, we start these farms we don't know what we're getting into. We're fueled by passion. But once the burnout kind of takes over from the passion, we end up going out of business. And then it leaves our industry in an even worse off place because then all these florists and wholesalers who had just started working with these new local flower farmers have to scramble to find new suppliers. And it just kind of like 
it brings us all down, you know, so that the better the better we all do, the better the industry is going to do and the more the industry is going to grow. And so that's why it's that's why it feels serious. And I take my place in this industry pretty seriously now. And that like if I I know I've I've seen success and I've helped a bunch of farmers see success. And so I want to continue to be this person who can kind of hopefully bridge the gap gap between some of the older, like our mentor farmers who don't have time to be writing books and then the new farmers and also bridging the gap between other worlds of small, small business skills and entrepreneurship and bring them back into our industry and share them with people. And it, it it's meant that I've taken a step back from farming. I'm only farming part-time right now, which is wild after farming forever, for, you know, farming all the time for so long. But this is, I mean, this is my, calling and I, I love it. And I, I, um, yeah, as you're saying, there's a lot that farmers can do from day one to start to set themselves up for success. And it's just so fun and it makes flower farming even better. Like if that could even be possible because flower farming is the best thing in the world, you know? I love that example, like that very real example you gave of like the Nigella and bachelor button description. Yeah. And this course isn't really, I hope you guys have picked up on this. This course isn't like your first foray into teaching. You just have a lot of like you have a lot of years of private coaching and success stories. So could you tell us a couple more stories of like, I worked with this farmer and this was the problem we discovered and the, you yeah. know, how we troubleshooted it because it might speak to problems that some of our viewers are find themselves in right now. Yeah, yeah, totally. Thank you. Um, yeah, and I have some of these case studies on my website, Flower Farming for Profit dot com, which I just finally launched after like having it on the back burner forever. But a few of them, a few come to mind. One is um, a student of mine, a past student of mine, Georgina, who took some of my very early flower farming courses through the junior college. And she was looking to have a small part-time business that she could have at home while caring for her son and spending more time at home, right? And she at first like wasn't sure what she was going to do. She was growing a little bit of everything. And then she really latched on, and I'm so, so, so happy she did. She latched on to some of my teaching really early on. And I said, focus, 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 specialize, specialize, specialize. I said, you don't need to grow everything. What if you can grow a couple crops and really run with them? And she took it to heart and started a sweet pea seed business. She has sweet pea gardens. And um, she hasn't looked back. She now has this, like, she actually moved from California up to Washington state, runs this really successful business, puts just the amount of time into it that she wants to, and is able to be home and be with her son and plant gardens for pleasure as well, you know? And so she says she's so glad that really early on she specialized. And it's such a, it's like the path not taken because so few people do that, especially from the beginning. And so I'm so grateful that she did it and it's going so well. And I love checking in with her and seeing how it's going. Um, there's another example, Lauren, who has Letter Bloom Farm, and she's someone in California, actually, who has been farming on the side. She works in the wine industry. She's a sought after freelancer for a bunch of weddings. And she was looking into expanding her farm this current current season because she has some leads for some some sales avenues, basically. Like she wants to be able to grow more, but she specifically wanted to plan out a new, I think it's quarter acre that she was looking at to see if she should take it on but she wanted to do it specifically on the back of sales projections that we built together. So she was like, I want to go into grocery. I want to do more of this wine club stuff. How can we wrap our heads around exactly how much, how many bouquets I might be able to sell and at what price points and how will that translate itself to this quarter acre? And that is that the best use of this quarter acre? So we were able to, it was really fun. It was almost like a, a case study from a business class or something, but it's like real life. And so we were able to work it out and she's going to take on that acreage. Mm -hmm. um, there's a really cool, I'll give one more example yeah. of a farmer I've worked with. And this is in the book. It's actually like the biggest case study in the book is a farmer, Joanna from Bluma Farm in Berkeley. She has the rooftop flower farm, which I'm sure a lot of people have seen. It's so cool. And she and I are contemporaries, actually. We went to farm school together. So we've been friends for a long time and we grew our businesses at the same time. But she hires me at some point every year to do some kind of business strategy with her because our brains just work differently. And also sometimes you just need a second set of eyes, a second opinion. And so I feel that that's what I've been for her. You know, I mentor a lot of people who are just getting started in flower farming. And she's an example of someone who's like right there at my level. And she has one of the most successful farms I know. But a few years ago, 
she was selling at a really big thriving farmer's market in San Francisco, the Ferry Plaza farmer's market. And she it was just burning her out. Her farm was too far from the city. It was before she had moved it back into the city. And she wanted to start to build out sales projections in order to see if she could afford to leave the farmer's market. So we recreated these sales projections in the book and kind of fine tuned them and made it even more just obvious for the reader what was going on. But she, you know, she did the whole, I'm going to juxtapose option A with option B, option A being stay at the farmer's market, market, option B being leave the farmer's market. And in her case, expand her sales to florists. Mm -hmm. So we mapped out like exactly how much revenue she would have to bring in and how she was going to get there. Was it, you know, she tried out like, do I need to increase each florist order by 20%? Do I need to bring on two more florists? What would some of these scenarios look like? So we were able to map it out really carefully and she ended up doing it and she hasn't looked back and she's been selling tons of flowers to florists in the Bay Area ever since with really specific crop plans. Okay. So I just think it's a, yeah, it's, it's just a cool example of using data and doing some guessing too. It's like, we don't always have the numbers, especially if we're just getting started, but to, to really plan going forward. Yeah. That's true. Yeah. So I want to talk about all the content creation. Cause like you said, you're like almost a part-time farmer now and you've just been like buckling down, writing the book and creating all this content. So I want to talk a little bit about like all that you have to offer and I'll put all these links and stuff in the description awesome. for you guys. But first up your Instagram flower farming for, for, for profit is awesome. I mean, obviously Instagram is a free tool for those that are consuming it, not in the labor for content creators, but that's just a great place to start to follow. I love how active you are on it. So just like we're all on Instagram and like, I see your story bubble pop up and I enjoy kind of like the daily or weekly reminders to kind of like stay in that business mindset. So yeah. I've really enjoyed your Instagram. And then we mentioned your book. Your book is on pre-order right now. It ships in a couple of weeks, which I'm sure you're probably like getting butterflies. Like people are going to start yeah. like posting pictures, physically holding yeah. it. But I think like at a minimum, this should be the purchase for everyone watching because we're all putting together like our crop plans right now in winter time and our dream sheets. And we're thinking about the next year, like all of our systems and planting schedules, like nothing is locked in yet. And so yeah. while you're doing that and you're thinking and kind of like your head is down on the like growing element, it's like have this business book next to you to kind of like keep you on the right track so as you're crop planning you're asking the right questions of your business plan your crop plan and so i think that's just like a must have you know we all probably have florets cut garden 101 i would get yep. this business book right alongside it because beautiful dahlias if they don't sell are just beautiful dahlias <laughs> Totally. So it's kind of like a tandem pair of like grow yeah. beautiful flowers, but then like sell them and earn some money so you can keep yeah. beautiful flowers. So I I'm excited it. to get the book. I've had it pre-ordered for weeks now. So that's Thank exciting. You. Actually, yeah. you know what? Erin Flora, Erin Benzikane wrote me the kindest blurb and I'll read it. I haven't, I haven't yeah. read it out loud. She said... Uh, so from Erin Benzikane, this must-have book is incredibly thoughtful, well-organized, and brimming with real-life examples. Lenny's down-to-earth, no-nonsense approach to the numbers is a breath of fresh air. So for her to write that, because she's obviously inspired so many people to get into this industry, I read her blog back when it was a blog, back when she was doing in-person workshops. I would read her blog and Jenny Love's blog back in like, you know, 2012, whatever, 2013, maybe, I don't know. And so for her to have... Um, recognize my book like that is just really kind and no, that's super awesome and I'm sure she recognizes like the content creation and impact she's made on the like growing beautiful product and growing the local flower movement and then you're coming yeah. alongside her being like and let's make this sustainable businesses so we can continue yeah. to make a dent in the local movement yeah. And so I want to talk to you about a little more details about the business course. Now that I think people have like really seen how much of a real deal you are and you have to offer. Can yeah. you, let's talk about like just who this course is for and maybe just who it's not for or not yet for. And the book would be a great starter and then perhaps yeah. the future move into a great question thank you and if it looks like I'm checking my email I'm actually opening my course module so yeah, I can right. tell you what they are yeah, yeah. I'm just gonna dabble over here um right. no, no nothing is more important <laughs> so um yeah I, the the course flower farming business academy is really created for farmers who have 
at the minimum at least a season or two of growing and selling flowers under their belt all the way up to like 10 years of growing. I think the majority of people are going to be in years like three to six, something like that. And I've talked, we had an early access sale. So I've met with a lot of people who were deciding whether or not to take the course for my kind of early access sale. And there were a few people who were really pretty new at flower farming. And I ended up encouraging one of them to sign up for the course. And the other one, I encouraged them to wait a year. And the reason was that you you kind of know what kind of person you are. And if you're the kind of person who gets excited by goal setting and learning a little bit perhaps out of your comfort zone and being with a cohort of people who are perhaps the majority of them are a little bit farther along than you. If you're the kind of person that would get jazzed by that, that's me. I'm like describing myself. Like I, I always think about playing tennis. Like I'd rather play tennis with people. I never play tennis, but who are better than me because it makes me better and it gets me excited to be better. And that's how I am with accounting classes. That's how I've been with all the business classes. I'm always a bit out of my element. I don't think this course will make anyone feel out of their element, but you might feel like, oh, I only have a year of sales history and here we're putting together these sales projections and my numbers are going to be partial guesses. And that's fine. So there's a lot of people who have signed up already who only have a year or two of growing and selling under their belts. But if you're someone who only has a year or two under your belt and you really don't have the time to think about growing the business yet, if the idea of goal setting is overwhelming and not exciting to you, then I think that would be a good a good um, reason to to wait. And yeah, or maybe to never take it, maybe to just buy the book. I'm never going to say that like everyone needs to take a big course in order to learn how to farm better. They certainly do not. There's that's so much that's a good, you make a good point because kind of around January too is the time when like there are a lot of course options and they're not yeah. the same, you know, they're speaking yeah. to different audiences and stuff. But I think like on the newer end of growers can kind of feel overwhelmed and be like, okay, well, I'm like seeing all these plugs. I'm seeing all of these people offer these courses. It's not $5. Right. So it's an investment. How do I even decide like what's right for me? And I'll share a little bit about like the decision-making I had with your course. And I'm thankful for my husband's wisdom. I remember going into year one, during year one, maybe going into year two, I was kind of like, I wanted to take the growing courses because Mm -hmm. I am really ambitious. I want to do things with excellence. So I was just like, okay, well, like I want to take their courses so that I'm creating an excellent product. And my husband was just like, like breaks, like, we don't know where this is going yet. Like you have all these books, you're consuming all these podcasts, like you are finding this information. So like, let's hold back on that investment. And yeah. I'm thankful that he said that because there is so much content creation out there for how to grow beautiful flowers that with time and, and just trial and error, you can figure it out. But there isn't as much content about how to run a profitable flower farming business. You know, there's, yeah. there's, there's, how do I say this? Like there's podcasts for businesses in general and e-commerce and SEO and websites. Yeah but it's generic or it's for like the girl that sells candles. It's like, okay, well the girl that sells candles on her website is doing something completely different than someone that's selling like a perishable product in person. Right. Like yeah. they're, they're very different. And so your course comes in and says like here, and I'll let you tell us about all the modules and the details and stuff, but your course is the one I'm really excited to take because it's like what takes to the next level. Like I have the yeah. flowers and I want to go from there. And that was kind of what quieted that noise, like you said, about all yeah. the different options out there. I was like, I'm yeah. going to go like this direction and follow like this yeah. path. I love that. And I'm so excited you're going to be in the class. Also, I already know you're my best student. I can just tell. Um, but yeah, I'm so I'm so happy to have you. And yeah, just like what you said, it's... Um, I think, it, you know, if you're out there wondering if you should take this course or if you should take any course... I think if what I say resonates with you and excites you and I feel like someone you want to spend time learning from, there'll be a lot of pre-recorded videos, but then lots of Q&As too. And all this information will be live. It's, some of it's live on my website now, but it'll open for a roll in a week. Well, on the 9th, I was going to say a week from today because we're recording on the 2nd, but it'll open on the 9th. But the pro- there are seven modules. One is all about business planning, but it's not going to be dry business planning. It's going to meet you where you're at and help you create a roadmap. We're going to do lots of goal setting and create some visual accountability for goal setting. Module two two is crop planning. 
a deep dive into crop planning in a way that makes it really fun and puts you in control. Then we'll move on to farm operations and specifically lean farming. A lot of stuff I've gained from my grant funded research over the past few years, a lot of these this data of what's worked for different farms and trying to increase efficiency on the farm. Then we'll move into sales and pricing for profit. We'll do a deep dive into different sales channels. There'll be a bonus about going deep on full service weddings because I that's actually the part of my business where I was first able to really um, increase profitability and do a lot better just by applying strategy. So I love talking about weddings, but if you're not doing weddings, you know, that's okay. You don't have to watch that part. Then we'll do a deep dive into marketing, specifically email marketing, um, specifically for flower farms. So I'll bring in some industry experts. We'll get you started with your email newsletter if you don't have one. If you do have one, we'll get you increasing the engagement and the click rates, learning how to be a better copywriter. We'll learn about SEO and analytics. Then the next module, module six, will be record keeping. So a lot of habit formation stuff around, like we were talking about earlier, how to track yield, how to track waste, what to not worry about and what to worry about whether you're a per paper person, an analog person, or you're a tech person, or you're somewhere in the middle, I'll give you strategies. And finally, module seven is mastering your numbers. So this is where we'll dive into <laughs> bookkeeping, which like does not sound sexy. So I know it's a word, you know, I'll say we're, we're learning your numbers, but you have to learn something about bookkeeping and you can decide whether or not you're going to do your own books or outsource it. But there's a way to learn enough about your numbers so that you can look at them and make decisions, know how you did in certain areas, make projections. And specifically, we'll talk about bookkeeping for a, a farmer florist as well. So th that's the meat of the course. And we'll have weekly live Q&As. We're going to have accountability pods. We're going to have a Facebook group. I'm putting everything I, everything I've ever done is being poured into this course. So this like, this is it. This is my big my big contribution and it'll only launch once a year. So yeah, as I said, we'll have the link below and any of your subscribers to your YouTube channel who want to join the course will get $200 off. And so I would encourage everyone to, who's interested to sign up for my webinar, whether or not you're on the course, the fence about the course, sign up for my mailing list in my webinar, and then you'll be emailed the coupon code that you can use later or not up to you. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I'm grateful. Thank you for having me walk through the modules. I love talking about this stuff so much and yeah. I'm, I'm glad I was able to keep it somewhat concise because I'm so excited by it. And I love that it, it really does feel like you're holding whoever signs up for the course and stuff, like you're holding our hands through a path that you walked through. And so it becomes like, it becomes like, it sounds overwhelming to begin with, but the whole point of the course is like to unoverwhelm, if that's a, yes. if that's a word yes. and to really give like, this is how you do it, you know, and to yep. follow along. And it, it, yes, it's an investment in your farm, but again, we were talking about labor and labor is hard to quantify. You yes. can upfront and invest and have your hand held with, someone who's walked this in the industry, or you can spend a lot more time like stumbling through or trial and erring through some of these lessons that yeah. through investment like could have been avoided. And that's one of the reasons why Eric and I want to take the course is like, we see it as clearly like it's saving us time and mistakes yes. by investing now, instead of like in year five or six, we learn like, oh yeah, that was a huge waste of time, or that was really not profitable or our email list could be twice as big by now if yeah. you know, we had learned these things. And so that's how we're viewing it. I'm really excited about it. But to end uh, here, so this is how we do in our videos now in the off season that are like longer form. Yeah. At the end of the video, there's a secret word that if you get to it, you comment in the comment section for all of the people that have watched this long. And so you, you need to pick what's the word that people need to comment if they they listen to our whole video. Yeah. My last one was popcorn because then it could be like the popcorn emoji that was like super easy. Oh, I love that. Put in. Yeah, yeah. But I was thinking something nerdy like data. Ooh, well, isn't there an emoji where it's like an Excel graph? Yes, yeah. Where it's like yeah. the yeah. arrow. That's what yeah. I think of with yeah. data. I yeah. like, that fits you perfectly. <laughs> <I know>. Data. <laughs> sadly yeah the totally. microsoft emoji <laughs> yeah yeah totally that's awesome Love well, that. well, anything you. else you yeah. want to share here at the end i'll link everything so it's easy for people to find yeah i think that's it i just appreciate you and i appreciate all the growers out there really 
bringing new energy in the, to this industry. And I, I love this industry and I will do anything for it. And um, yeah, thanks for, thanks for sharing what you do with everyone. Awesome. Well, thanks guys for watching. Thank you, Lenny, for all your time and wisdom. And we'll see you in the next video.